Hello, my name is Carol Levy. I'm the director of the Mount Sinai Diabetes Center, and I also play a key role in diabetes clinical research here at Mount Sinai. Hi, my name is David Lamb. I am an endocrinologist, and I'm also the medical director for the Clinical Diabetes Institute for the Mount Sinai Health System. Yeah, so um, over the last now year, patients have often reached out to us in our practice asking a question related to what happens if I get COVID-19? What should I do? How should I manage this? And I think that there's, you know, over time, the answer to this question has changed a bit for all of us as practitioners um, in terms of providing care. But the first and foremost is, is obviously to take care of yourself, provide yourself supportive care, make sure that you're breathing okay, make sure that you're feeling well, you're not having any severe distress. For someone with diabetes, it would be important to check your blood sugars, make sure they're not very high or very low because sometimes blood sugars can shift when people become sick. Over time and more recently, I think another consideration that has come up is because people, and we'll get into this in a bit more detail, with diabetes are potentially in a higher risk group to have less optimal outcomes. That doesn't mean every person with diabetes has less optimal outcomes, but people can, based on what we know at this point, that there might be consideration to contact your primary care provider to ask about whether you'd be eligible for some type of an, one of these new immunologic therapy treatments that may actually to help reduce the disease burden and improve a clinical course for a patient if they were to get sicker or not be doing well. David, do you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that you addressed a lot of the, the, the very good key points, uh, Carol. You know, I think that anytime anyone is diagnosed with, with a COVID-19 infection, it's pretty overwhelming. Uh, you're you're worried about yourself, you're worried about your family members, you're worried about people you may have worked with and in, been in contact and, and all those other implications. And, you know, I think the first thing is, you know, just like you said, Carol, you, you focus in on your own health first and you make sure that you're sort of checking off all those boxes. And I'd say definitely, even if maybe nothing actually is going to, to change drastically, touching base with your primary care doctor. I agree. To your point about, you know, asking if you're eligible for certain early interventional therapies, checking in with your diabetes doctor, just even if they're, uh, you know, should I still be taking all the medicines the way I've been taking them? What should I look out for? You know, any sort of uh, any pearls, you know, from now that we've been in it for almost a year from from your endocrinologist perspective, what should be what should be looked out for? Um, I think just kind of communication is key uh, to help through anyone through this, you know, like a really stressful experience too. Yeah, no. And, and I think that something that we've done with many of our patients is, is proactively before they get sick is sort of go through them sort of what would the care plan be if something were to occur or come up that could be problematic. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that it's similar to the first question, right? You know, what should I do if I get COVID-19? But I think if we could think about it more um, specifically, let's say in the context of, of someone who's living with diabetes, right. you know, what, what happens if I get it? Um, you know, we've seen, and Carol and myself were, uh, you know, since March of 2020, uh, we were talking to patients both in the outpatient environment, as well as looking at and taking care of patients on the inpatient, and seeing the myriad of effects that COVID-19 infection can have just on diabetes and on glucose levels. Um, so oftentimes, you know, patients may have, you know, a complete loss of sense of taste and smell, they stop eating. And so the inclination may be, well, maybe I should be monitoring for more low blood sugars because I'm not eating as much. But you also, as many people living with diabetes can attest to when you're sick, your blood sugars, even if you're not eating, paradoxically will rise. And so blood sugars can, can do both uh, in the setting of a, of a COVID-19 infection. And I think, you know, Carol mentioned this, the importance is to monitor, you know, be, if testing your blood sugars more regularly, especially if you're taking insulin as part of your therapy. Um, and then ultimately, if, if you end up getting hospitalized, um, if, if that if it comes to that point, Making sure that, you know, to Carol's point again, having that care plan, knowing your medications and being able to tell your hospital care team, 
I take these three medications for my diabetes, communicating that with them, making sure that they're aware, and then making sure that they're also, in addition to treating you for the COVID-19 infection, monitoring your blood sugars and managing them well. Um, we know that blood sugar control during any hospitalization, but particularly also COVID-19 uh, infections is, is very important. Um, Carol, do you have anything to- Yeah, no, and I wanna reiterate everything that David said there. And just to make a point, it's always best to have that medication list ready to be prepared to answer questions because people, when they're, when they're quite ill, they will come to the closest hospital. And this I can say from our perspective, somebody will come to our hospital having been cared for wonderfully somewhere else, but we don't have access to that information. So having the ability, because the, the, the person who's sick may not be able to share every detail of when they took their last dose of, of pills or, or insulin, when this happened, where they, what medications they've been on most recently, are, what are their, all their recent doses and what has been happening. All those pieces make it easier for us to provide optimal care. Um, you know, and additionally, depending on what one's treatment regimen is, whether if you're somebody who's utilizing diabetes related technology, make sure that you bring all of that with you so that the team will be aware. Never just like say, okay, well, I'm sick, I'm on insulin pump. They're not gonna want the pump in the hospital. I'm gonna take it off. That's not the way to go. You always show up with your treatment and then let the team that's managing you you know, provide you, provide you care in the way that fits with what your prior treatment regimen is. So that's a great question. And patients ask me that a lot. And it really depends upon the age range of people in terms of what we know about potential risks, and then also other health issues that can be related. And the thing that I also say to everyone is, is that this disease sadly doesn't follow all the rules. And we know that, meaning that a young, healthy person, someone who's 25 years old with diabetes gets COVID-19, there is never a guarantee at this point that that person will have a perfectly you know, easy clinical course, a few sniffles and be all better. You can't predict it. We've had some patients who are much older that we would normally be more worried about who breeze through it with no problems and other younger patients who've gotten quite ill. So should you be worried? Well, I hate to say the word worry, but you should be cautious is what I would like to say. Everyone should just be really careful to ensure that they're maximizing the likelihood that they are not going to get COVID-19 or to protect themselves from any high-risk situations where they could be at risk for it. David, do you have anything else you want to put in there for, that I'm forgetting here? No, I mean, I think that, um, I think you summed it up really well there. And one of the, the biggest frustrations, I think both patients as well as medical providers have had throughout the pandemic is there's so much that's not known. And just like you were saying, you don't know if you're going to be the person that just loses their sense of smell and taste and that's it or you don't know if you're gonna be that person that winds up in the hospital. Uh, and, and so I think to your point, taking every precaution possible to avoid infection, um, you know, and, and is, is paramount. And that's what we try to stress to all our patients. Yeah. And, and that's what we do as clinicians as well, is yeah. that one needs to be cautious. Yeah. That's an easy one. Yeah. The, the answer is yes. Uh, you know, and, I know that there, you know, look, I, I see a lot of patients. I know Carol does too. We've had this discussion with lots of our patients and we've heard a lot of reasons why people are a little nervous about getting the vaccine. You know, the first thing I tell people is I got the vaccine. My parents got the vaccine. My wife's not eligible yet, but once she becomes eligible, she's getting the vaccine. You know, I, I think that to, to Carol's point, we just saw such the devastation that um, a COVID-19 infection can do uh, and anything that we can do to, to prevent the infection or even just prevent severe disease is worth it. Uh, we just want the best for our patients. And we know that people living with diabetes, it raises the increased risk for severe disease. Um, and I think that, you know, it, when the first few were coming out and we would saw statistics and, um, I, you know, people would say, well, um, I don't know. It's not, it's not 94, it's not a hundred percent effective. Take the 94%, you know, right. it's, 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 it's better than 0%. And even, you know, people are worried about side effects of the vaccine. Well, 
you know, I hear that you have a low grade fever, maybe some aches after the vaccine, you know, taking that, those 48 hours of, of not feeling the greatest compared to winding up in the hospital on a ventilator, if that could be the difference, I think it's, it's well worth it. Um, and there's a lot of, and each reason that people are anxious about the vaccine, a little bit suspect about the vaccine, we're not, dis, you know, we're not just brushing them aside. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons, good reasons to have the vaccine. And you got to talk to your doctor about it. You know, you just you reach out to your primary care doctor, your diabetes doctor, anyone and, and ask them so that they can personalize their, their advice to you too. Um, Carol, any? Yeah, no, no, I agree. And I sometimes get questions from patients as well who have already had COVID-19. Well, shouldn't I just get one vaccine? Do I really need two? We are not the experts in the areas, but what we can say is the CDC, which is, you know, obviously an organization that we all follow the guidelines for, is recommending that if it's a two vaccine um, treatment option, one should take both vaccines, um, not just say, well, I'm going to take one. The, um, the second point, um, you know, just, just to consider with all of this is, is that once again, as David said, even if you get a bit sick from the vaccine, it is so much better than the potential risk of what one could have with COVID-19. And there isn't a good way to predict what someone's response is going to be the, the vaccine with even our division different people had different levels of symptoms after the vaccine, but you can be rest assured that two days of feeling crummy is a lot better than taking that chance that you may get a lot worse. And even if someone has had COVID-19, we have seen cases of people getting it a second time. So just having had it once doesn't mean you're clear and you don't need to take the vaccine. We really wanna build immunity to protect everybody. So the answer is that this one is probably the easiest question that we could possibly answer is you take whatever you can get and they all work pretty darn well. You know, people start to look at numbers, percentages, 94, 95, this one is lower, but this one was evaluated when there's more disease strains out there. Any vaccine you get is going to provide you protection. It, there isn't, you know, patients ask me, all the time, you get the one that's available to you and, and you take it. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and all of these vaccines, you know, the ones that are currently available in the U.S., they've gone through clinical trials with many, many patients. Um, and in addition, now we've got, you know, close to three months, maybe a little bit more than that, of just real world um, experience with that as well. So they've been used in, in a lot of a lot of people living in America, uh, as well as globally, of course. But um, but I think that I agree with Carol. You take what you can get. Um, it's it's um, sadly there's there's not enough, and those are those numbers seem to be improving. But um, if you're able to get it, you should get it. Yeah, you know, there's no uh, not that I'm aware of, at least in terms of any published literature showing that people living with diabetes get sicker after the vaccine. And certainly in my clinical practice, I have not seen that. I would say that there are potentials for impact very short term on glucose levels. Um, you know, the intention of the vaccine is to kind of provoke your immune system. And when it does that, a lot of other chemicals and hormones in the body are triggered as a part of your immune response that can also affect your, uh, your body's response to insulin, whether it's your own insulin or the insulin that you're injecting. Um, and so some people find that maybe for two days, maybe even less, they have slightly higher blood sugars. Um, I've actually had a couple of patients that have told me that I've, they've had slightly lower blood sugars. So, you know, going back to what we said about, should I, you know, the importance is monitoring, you know, regular monitoring, keeping track, especially, you know, if you're at, on medications that could cause low blood sugars or um, you want to just kind of stay on top of that. And, it, and it's in a hundred percent of my patients, it's short lived any of those effects on, on their blood sugar. Yeah, and, and I and, and I agree with David, and I would say that in in you know we're we're in some ways lucky in that as endocrinologists we have a lot of experience with patients of ours getting vaccines early because patients people with diabetes are in a higher risk group, so we've taken care of a lot of people and seen it. It is um, rare that someone I can't even think of one patient that has had significant blood sugar issues that has created a problem for them.
Um, people have really done fine. And, and as David said, I think it's more not per se the vaccine that's causing the problem with the blood sugars. It's more that the body's sort of stress response. You make some adrenaline, you make a little bit of stress hormones, you know, vaccine hurts your arm. You feel a little uncomfortable. It's like someone with diabetes does public speaking. Their blood sugar goes up sometimes. These are just sort of some of the things that people think about. It's more of just a standard stress response when people get better from it. It shouldn't precipitate anything worse. Yeah. The one, I remember one question I received from a patient, uh, because some people with, who are living with diabetes will actually wear some of their technology on, around their arms. Uh, yeah. And one question someone asked me was, would, will it be okay to get the injection, the, the immunization in the same arm that I happen to be wearing my sensor? Um, and, and, you know, the overall, they're not, the where they're injecting the the, the vaccine is usually not in the place where you're actually wearing your sensor or even your, your insulin infusion set um, because they're injecting into the muscle. Um, but the, so in, in all cases, it's fine. Really the only thing I think to think about, which I think I shared with the patient too, was if your arm is sore, your flexibility and, and, and maneuvering, um, if, you're, if you're using that, that as well for, for your, in, your diabetes therapy. Um, but it shouldn't affect the, the ability for you to, the, or the accuracy or the, um, exactly. the, the quality of the, the delivery of medication. Yeah. And just to reiterate, these vaccines were administered in clinical trials to people with diabetes. So a lot of this has already been evaluated. And now, as David said, we have a much more big real world experience on it. And there just have not been any, um, to date for sure, noted reports of any challenges.